Good morning. I'm Suzanne Schulte, president of the Defense Forum Foundation, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to our forum, What to Do for Hong Kong. To begin, I want to especially thank Jason West working behind the scenes to set up a secure and safe platform for us for this program as our speakers are joining us from England, Australia, and the United States of America. For background, DFF forums were founded in the 1980s to give congressional staff an opportunity to hear from expert speakers on critical topics in a bipartisan collegial atmosphere. This morning, we have several expert speakers, in fact, very brave democracy champions and eyewitnesses to the recent events in Hong Kong. My plan is to introduce them briefly as I want you to hear directly from them, their stories, and then we will ask a series of questions and then take questions from the audience. Honorable Ted Hu served as a Hong Kong legislative counselor and was the leading campaigner in the legislature fighting against the Communist Party of China's actions to destroy Hong Kong's freedom and autonomy until he had to flee. Joey Su was an active participant in Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement as a student activist organizing local grassroots campaign events until she too had to flee. She was part of a movement that touched the heart of the world. My very dear longtime friend and internationally acclaimed human rights activist, Ben Rogers, who was the co-founder and chief executive for Hong Kong Watch and a longtime champion for Hong Kong, Burma and North Korea. Well, basically for people everywhere whose rights are threatened. So to begin, my first question, we're gonna go in order from Ted, Joey, and then Ben. But my first question is, please share your personal stories, eyewitness experience as leaders in working to uphold Hong Kong's freedom and autonomy. We wanna hear about your background and why you ended. Yes, thank you, Susan, and uh, for the opportunity for me to speak to many of you. And so uh, I'm Ted Ho, I'm former legislator. I served the Hong Kong legislature for the past four years. And I was, Hong Kong has gone through so much that it's hard to think about where to begin telling my story. But I'll begin by telling how Hong Kong is different now. Um, now my, my heart's heavier knowing that seeing many of my comrades in legislature uh, they were sitting next to me. They were, uh, we were struggling the whole time, the four years in legislature. Now they're in jail and I cannot go back home. And so I also uh, would like to tell the change by telling you that many street fighters, uh, many of us uh, activists now also in jails. So I feel like I've lost everyone uh, around me. And so uh, I ended up here in exiles. And this is a big change. And what I've witnessed uh, starting from 2019 is police brutality, is the cruelty of uh, political uh, persecutions. So I would say I've experienced uh, uh, both the soft way, uh, my fight in the parliament, and also the hard way, the, the experiencing uh, all the street struggles by young protesters. So what I've experienced firsthand would be uh, tear gas and pepper sprays and rubber bullets and all kinds of weapons for these batons. Uh, witnessing scenes after scenes, uh, how young protesters were beaten up. And now Hong Kong has totally fallen into a complete controlled, at least institutionally and politically, uh, by uh, CCP, by Beijing. So we've lost our last breath of freedoms and that we have been enjoying for uh, 23 years after the handover. Even Hong Kong wasn't a democracy. Now we realize that we had uh, some high degree of freedom in the past, but now it's totally gone. Uh, in the past, we were comfortably uh, chanting political slogans, organizing uh, assemblies and doing streets demonstrations. Now these are all banned and not because of COVID, but because uh, of CCPs uh, taking our freedom away. 
So we're, we're disappointed. We are a few furious. It's outrageous, right? Uh, that we have, we are supposed to have our promises made written in our basic law. That is Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kongs, and that that's of course is. Uh, sorry, I've been hearing different noises. Sorry, are you hearing similar noises? Sorry about that. Yep. Yeah, of, of uh, we, we've uh, lost that promises that we are supposed uh, to have Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy, and now it's Beijing ruling Hong Kong's, and we lost all the all the freedoms with the national security law uh, passed in Hong Kong, and with all the electoral changes uh, in our parliament. So in in the situation in Hong Kong now is that uh, it's a total, there's a total elimination of political participations uh, by all the Democrats, by all people who have a democratic belief. And we are totally excluded from, from the parliament, from the institutions. And we have to face continuous uh, police brutality and all the uh, grievances. And so it's, of course, it breaks my heart that uh, now uh, it's a home. There's a home that I cannot go back to. And so the, the reason why I left Hong Kong uh, is that um, I knew if I stayed in Hong Kong, uh, I wouldn't be able to continue my advocacy for Hong Kong's freedom and democracies. I would end up in jails. So uh, being in jail itself, uh, it's not frightening to me, but then the losing the freedom to speak for Hong Kong and no one can speak uh, anywhere for Hong Kong and uh, it's the fact of it is frightening. So I decided that it's now my uh, lifetime mission that I should be, continue to speak for those who cannot speak, for those who lost their freedom completely. And I feel that um, it's uh, my responsibility now to act for Hong Kong. So my work uh, internationally would be uh, lobbying uh, for more freedoms for Hong Kongs by freedom of uh, free nations and leaders uh, in the world by putting up uh, sanctions, different kinds of uh, targeted sanctions and economic sanctions against human rights violators in Hong Kong and in, in Beijing, and to push forward like both plans for those who were prosecuted, uh, for the young people now uh, broadly being prosecuted. And of course, for a more uh, boycotting or isolating approach uh, towards uh, the China policies, uh, less reliant on trade with Beijing and put a uh, lot more regards as to uh, human rights situations in Hong Kong in, in terms of uh, economic relationships. So I, I hope that in the future, uh, free world, free, free world leaders can join hands together and that Hong Kong people will rise against and will take back our freedoms. And it's my determination that we will uh, go home uh, in a free Hong Kong. Oh, go ahead, Joe, you're next. So, thank you so yeah. much, Susan, for organizing this. And thank you so much for having me. So my name is Joey, and I was a student activist back in Hong Kong. And I'm currently also a part of Hong Kong Watch, which is a very, very, very outstanding international human rights group. So I myself pretty much became a student activist by accident, because at the very beginning, I was nominated as the vice president of my student union, because no one else in my school was willing to take up positions in our student union because we all understand that nowadays in Hong Kong if we are taking up a position in the student union it would be very very time consuming and then 
aside from that, you will also have to put into a lot of efforts in organizing different activities for not only your schoolmates, but then also to contribute to the society. But then a friend of mine reached out and asked if I want to take up the responsibility because he felt like I have always been passionate and also been keen about social issues and especially political issues in Hong Kong. I, at the very beginning, hesitated because I know how time consuming that would be. And I also was not confident about myself on whether I would be able to do my best and then to serve my schoolmates. But then later on, I was convinced by him and also the other friends. So very soon afterwards, I was nominated by our student council to be the vice president of the City University of Hong Kong Student Union. And just a few days after my nomination, the very historical pro-democracy struggle in Hong Kong kicked off. And very naturally, I started organizing not only uh, sharings or seminars inside of my school campus, but then also started organizing different grassroots events from class boycotting campaigns to larger scale protests in Hong Kong. And in September 2020, I made the decision to leave Hong Kong given the very great risk that I felt myself were being put at because of the national security legislation in Hong Kong. And I felt like, as Ted have mentioned, that when we activists, politicians, or protesters were thinking about whether we should leave Hong Kong or not, we always have a question in mind on whether, on whether, in, in what ways can we better serve the city that we love so much, whether we should be staying in Hong Kong and continue to participate in demonstrations or continue to do other things in the city or whether we should choose to leave Hong Kong and then to play a role in international advocacy for Hong Kong. So I felt like that is a dilemma not only me or Ted have faced or have been put in, but then also a dilemma for a lot of uh, activists and also protesters who that, that also went through when we are thinking about whether we should leave Hong Kong or not. And we also understand that there will be a lot of uncertainties, self-doubt, and also other unknown things ahead of us when we think about leaving Hong Kong. And we were not sure whether we can still continue to be the voice for the people who are still inside of Hong Kong who can no longer participate in social movements or can no longer speak out their own minds in Hong Kong. And we all had the kind of self-doubt and also uncertainty. But then I believe um, both me and Ted felt like we could uh, play our role better and also to make better use of our connections and also our, 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 our position as an activist or as a former legislator of Hong Kong. So we decided to leave Hong Kong. And for myself, I felt like I could continue to participate in international advocacy and continue my activism. Uh, in an international arena. So I decided to leave Hong Kong by the end of 2020 and came to the United States and is currently based in Washington, D.C., continuing my activism to continue to lobby for international attention on Hong Kong and also to push for the implementation of different legislations that would defend the values of Hong Kong and would also protect the people of Hong Kong who are still suffering under the very great suppression from the Chinese Party. And yeah, so that is basically my background. Suzanne, it's a really great uh, pleasure and privilege to be with you today. Thank you so much for organizing this. And it's a particular pleasure to uh, follow on from my friends, Ted and, and Joey. Uh, I um, first got involved in human rights work uh, when I was a university student. And actually just prior to going to university when I was 18 years old, uh, I had spent six months uh, uh, in a, a year off between school, high school and university uh, teaching English in China in the city of Qingdao. So um, my, that was sort of my where my interest in, in China as a whole began. And then my interest in, in human rights uh, started very soon after that at university. <clears throat> and when I graduated from university, I... Uh, wanted to go into journalism, but w wanted to stay engaged with human rights in my, at least in my spare time. And my first job uh, was in Hong Kong. And I lived in Hong Kong for the first five years uh, after the handover from 1997 to 2002, working as a journalist, but also establishing 
a presence in Hong Kong for uh, the human rights organization that I uh, worked with for many, many years and continue to work with uh, even today, uh, Christian Solidarity Worldwide, uh, CSW. Uh, and um, what I think when I look back at my time living in Hong Kong, what's so striking is that during those first five years after the handover, Hong Kong was a free and open city. Uh, as Ted said earlier, it wasn't a full democracy, but uh, it had democratic elections for the legislature, uh, and it certainly had basic freedoms. And I uh, remember using my freedoms that I had living there, both to uh, speak out on political issues in Hong Kong as a, as a journalist, um, but even more so, I uh, actually used the, the space I, I had in Hong Kong to speak out for others elsewhere in Asia. So uh, I regularly spoke in, in churches and organized demonstrations and spoke at the Foreign Correspondence Club on the situation in places like uh, Burma, North Korea, uh, mainland China. And all of that was possible uh, then. I left Hong Kong in 2002. <clears throat> and from 2002 until the umbrella movement in 2014, I really didn't pay much attention to the political situation in Hong Kong because during those years, at least on the surface, uh, things seemed to be pretty much okay. And so I was focused on the other parts of, of Asia that I've mentioned. Um, but the turning point for me was uh, the umbrella movement uh, in 2014. And I uh, realized that something fundamental was, uh, was happening. Incidentally, I should say that whenever I speak on Hong Kong, I either carry a, a yellow umbrella, if if that's appropriate, uh, but it's a sunny day in London and I'm indoors, so I, I, I don't have my yellow umbrella with me. Um, but if I don't have the umbrella, I wear a yellow tie. Um, and I, I think I've done that without fail every time that I've spoken on Hong Kong. Um, but essentially, I started to to speak out initially just in a, as an individual in my spare time. So from 2014 to 2017, uh, I was still working for CSW full time, but uh, starting to write and speak and talk to members of parliament. And uh, I remember hosting uh, on visits to London some of Hong Kong's most prominent uh, activists, uh, Joshua Wong, who's now in jail, Nathan Law, who's now in exile, uh, and uh, Anson Chan. Uh, and by about 2017, I then realized that it was no longer sustainable for me as just one individual in my spare time to be doing this, I realized that we really needed an organization to uh, sustain the, the advocacy. And I also realized that at that time, level of awareness about what was happening in Hong Kong was uh, surprisingly low. And I realized therefore there was a need to, to step up the advocacy efforts. Uh, and so I came together with a few other friends uh, and formed uh, Hong Kong Watch which was launched in uh, December 2017. Um, Hong Kong Watch has a number of uh, distinguished patrons uh, uh, associated with us. So the last governor of Hong Kong, uh, Lord Patton, Chris Patton, the former British Foreign Secretary, Sir Malcolm Rifkind, and a number of other parliamentarians who, who've worked uh, with us uh, in this. Um, but just to, uh, I should just share a few direct experiences of um, uh, of my own uh, facing the CCP, I, I of course have experienced nothing like what Ted and Joey and the people of Hong Kong face, but I've had a small taste. Um, the first of which was that um, a couple of months before we launched Hong Kong Watch, uh, I felt it was very important to try to go back to Hong Kong to, uh, I, I had been back a few times during the uh, years since I'd left, but I felt it was especially important to go back and uh, hear an update from people uh, on the ground. and um, But unfortunately, uh, the Chinese Communist Party somehow became aware that I was planning to go, uh, and I was denied entry on arrival in Hong Kong. That actually inadvertently gave um, our plans to launch Hong Kong Watch uh, a, a, an extra publicity boost because my case drew a lot of media attention and political attention. I, I was probably the first or one of the first uh, foreigners to be denied entry to Hong Kong, although there have been a number of cases uh, since mine. Um, but that was the, the first incident. Uh, since then, I've, I've also experienced, uh, uh, for at least a few years, um, a steady flow of um, 
threaten, sort of vaguely threatening uh, letters that have come uh, by uh, mail to my home address and also to my neighbors uh, in the street where I live in London. So not, not an office address, not an, a public address that is easily available, but my home residential address that obviously can be found, but is, is uh, not something I advertise. Uh, the first letter that came had my photograph on it uh, taken off the internet. And uh, it, was, it came in an envelope stamped and postmarked Hong Kong. And uh, it was addressed to dear resident. Uh, and it said, um, this person, uh, Ben Rogers, lives in your street. Uh, he claims to be a human rights activist, but he actually works for British intelligence, which, by the way, I don't. I, I wish I did, because then I could actually do something about these things. But, um, uh, and, and it said, you know, please try to find out his movements and his plans. And this letter went to every house in the street where I live in, in London. Uh, there was then a succession of similar letters uh, over a period of a, a year or two. Uh, but also my mother, uh, who lives in a totally different part of the country, she started to receive uh, letters saying, please tell your son to stop doing what he's doing. Um, now, thankfully, my mother is very relaxed and very supportive about this work. And she took the view that she'd given up try trying to tell me what to do many, many years ago. And... Um, and uh, she was she was fine with it. Um, I've also had a number of British members of parliament uh, being directly lobbied by the Chinese embassy specifically about me, uh, the Chinese embassy asking them to tell me to to stop doing what I'm doing. And of course, British MPs uh, are not going to do that. They they alerted me to the fact that they'd been lobbied, but they they certainly didn't try to uh, silence me. And then finally, um, my last uh, example is that um, at the uh, UK Conservative Party conference uh, in 2018, uh, we um, organized a, a, a meeting um, uh, with three of the most prominent pro-democracy leaders, Martin Lee, who last week was given a suspended jail sentence, uh, Benny Tai, uh, and Nathan Law, who's now in exile. And um, at the very end of this event, uh, well, when we were doing the Q&A, uh, a Chinese, um, it turns out she was a Chinese journalist for, for a state television, uh, started uh, out of nowhere just uh, screaming uh, abuse uh, at me initially. I was seemed to be her first target um, uh, and uh, shouting that I was anti-China, that I was trying to destroy China. That was in response to a comment I made where I, I made it clear I'm not at all anti-China. I, I love China as a country and the people. It's the Chinese Communist Party that I'm uh, opposed to. Uh, anyway, she started. She continued screaming at me. When uh, somebody approached her to uh, ask her to to sit down and to and you know, he just politely said, "Madam, you've made your point. Could you resume your seat?" Uh, she hit him, and um, she hit him actually uh, two or three times. And some of this was caught on camera. And went viral um, uh, on on uh, world media, um, and she ended up being being arrested by the uh, British police and and charged and convicted with uh, with assault. Um, but that was uh, that was in Britain. That was in the city of Birmingham. Uh, uh, so I share that because I think it illustrates that the issues we're talking about today are yes, first and foremost, uh, the challenges facing the people of Hong Kong, but actually they're issues that affect all of us. Uh, and if we uh, allow what the CCP has done to Hong Kong in flagrant breach of an international treaty, uh, if we allow them to get away with that with impunity, then you can be sure they're not going to stop there. You know, Taiwan will be next, other, other democracies will, will be next, and ultimately our own freedoms will be affected. So that's why I uh, have uh, ended up doing what I'm doing now, and it's, it's why I will continue to, to speak out until uh, the people of Hong Kong are free. And, and I'd just close by saying I, I'm, I'm passionate about Hong Kong for two reasons. The first is that it was once my home uh, for five years. Um, but the second is that uh, if we allow a free and open city to be turned almost overnight, or certainly over the course of a year or so, uh, into uh, a totally repressed uh, uh, CCP-controlled city, then that should be a concern uh, for all of us who, who value freedom. Um, 
powerful, powerful. I, and that leads me to my next question, which is um, very important because you make the point about if we don't preserve freedom in Hong Kong, it puts all of us at stake. And I think that's such an important point because we saw that the democracy movement clearly won the hearts of the uh, hearts of the people of Hong Kong, so many participating in that, but also um, they won the hearts of people all over the world. But things changed so dramatically, so quickly. How did, how did that happen? What were the steps the CCP took that, that should be a warning to others of the CCP's methods? Yes. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, I agree when you said that uh, the Hong Kong freedom movement, the anti-extradition movement, won the heart of many, quite many of the Hong Kongers have waken up. They have never been that waken up that now they are determined to, to fight, fight uh, for their, uh, for their uh, own freedom uh, for life. Uh, but then uh, you're also right that now with many changes and with all the measures CCP has imposed upon Hong Kong, and politically and institutionally, uh, it's very, very tough for, for us uh, to continue our fight. So what's been used by CCP, of course, uh, there are a few areas. Uh, firstly, of course, the draconian laws, uh, the national security laws. So with that law, it's directly, uh, CCP is directly spreading fear, uh, the fear of uh, being locked up for decades and for life, and also the fear of not getting bails once you're charged, even before a uh, proper trial. So um, now people are afraid of uh, chanting just one slogan or participating in politics. That's why you can see more and more politicians quitting their political career completely just for having their own freedom back. So it's understandable. So uh, they have all have families. So it's the draconian law that's spreading uh, a lot of fear in Hong Kong. Secondly, of course, uh, now uh, uh, in different institutions, in, in, in our legislature, in our statutory bodies, public bodies, there's, uh, uh, I would say, a complete, complete replacement of all personnel and all uh, bureau heads and all officials replacing those uh, liberal minded people and those uh, uh, who are fair and those who live up to uh, st standards and rules and procedures, replacing them with c their own CCP people. Of course, this is happening. That's why they changed the electoral systems, uh, not allowing anyone uh, uh, any dissent in the latch code. So it happens not only in the in our legislature, it's in uh, every governmental department, every public offices. Of course, um, the CCP influenced Hong Kong uh, in education. So education is used to be a tool, it's been manipulated by CCP to be a brainwashing uh, mechanism uh, to, pro to promote their CCP's uh, propaganda. So, for example, uh, on top of the national security law, now the regime has changed uh, school cur curriculums, uh, both in secondary and primary schools. And now they, uh, teachers are required to teach what's meant by national security, and not meant by being patriot, and what, what is meant by nas uh, nationalism. Using these as the tools to brainwash you know, uh, our, our children, uh, for them to believe that uh, it's immoral to be in oppositions against uh, the country. And uh, of course, uh, not to stand up against injustice and not to fight for freedom because that would be harmful for national securities. So these kind of propagandas. And of course, uh, the CCP went further in trying to alter and destroy uh, professional standards and best practices in different industries and sectors. That's why we have seen uh, banks like HSBC 
not following uh, the procedures uh, and guidelines and just perform political orders of uh, freezing dissidents' accounts. I'm uh, my uh, life witness or uh, victim of, of that happening to me, having my assets and my family's savings frozen by HSBC because of uh, the regime's order. So even, even the teachers and ha had to be monitored uh, in in every classroom. So now uh, probation legislators are proposing installing CCTV in every classroom to monitor teach what teacher has to say. So uh, teachers cannot live up to their uh, professional morals at all. And of course, with the national security laws, uh, uh, the judi judicial judiciary once in the independent now are interfered by the, the power of, of the administrations. So the, the administration can always step in and and select judges and uh, interfere as to uh, bail pr proceedings. So by all these, the CCP is destroying all professional best practices that could possibly uh, uphold uh, uh, justice in the societies. So of course, lastly, and I think that was with all, what's most obvious is the economic soft power uh, that China it's expanding itself and, and influencing different countries, third world countries by uh, investing in infrastructures in their own countries um, and buying up their assets and exercising uh, economic duress. And so that uh, they build up allies uh, in different parts of the world uh, with authoritarian uh, countries. I, th I think these all the measures are uh, some are obvious and some uh, can be subtle, but these are all uh, happening comprehensively in, in Hong Kong. That's why Hong Kong is changed uh, bit by bit. And now with the national security law totally different. And I, I believe that these are the procedures, the, these measures are the warning signs to uh, different uh, nations uh, in, in face of infiltrations and by, by Beijing in their own countries. And these should be uh, what uh, that should remind them of how they should be, they should better defend themselves. Yeah, and actually, on top of um, uh, what Ted has mentioned, Ted has the, mentioned about the electoral change passed by the Chinese National People's Congress a few weeks ago, and also aside from the uh, very unprecedented mass arrests of uh, of making use of the national security legislation, we are also seeing a continuous and also a more severe crackdown on our academic freedom and also of the other freedoms that the people of Hong Kong should be enjoying right now. So for example, for academic freedom, aside from the uh, very brutal and also very brainwashing uh, education reform introduced by the Hong Kong government onto in, in secondary schools and also in primary schools in Hong Kong, we are also seeing a continuous crackdown and also restriction imposed on higher education institutions in Hong Kong. So for example, we are seeing a lot of these kind of like research projects funded by the Chinese Communist Party or these Chinese Communist Party related institutions on different issues, to topics related to the Belt and Road Initiative or, us, or, or, or the other topics and issues that are beneficial to the Chinese Communist Party. We are seeing a continuous pressure being put on different scholars and also students of higher institutions when they are investigating or researching on topics that, that are seen as disobedience or seen as not beneficiary to the Chinese Communist Party. And aside from that, given the implementation of the national security legislation, we are also seeing that professors, scholars, and also students of colleges in Hong Kong, of high schools in Hong Kong, are being afraid of being uh, put at risk of being uh, arrested under the national security legislation. So they, so they were basically left with no choice but then to censor themselves so that they won't be arrested or charged with subversion or colluding with foreign forces if they are going to investigate or research on rather sensitive topics. And aside from the uh, suppression on academic freedom in Hong Kong, we are also seeing the continuous pressure being put on social or being put on media outlets in Hong Kong. So for example, for the uh, radio television Hong Kong RTHK, 
we see that the Hong Kong government decided to change their management board. They decided to replace uh, uh, the, uh, the, the more senior managers of RTHK with a pervading loyalist. We see commentators of uh, different programs at RTHK being replaced by pro-Beijing pro figures and also pro-Beijing commentators. We are also seeing one of the most uh, one of the most vocal and also one of the biggest pro-democracy media outlet in Hong Kong, Apple Daily, being attacked by the head of police force of three for three consecutive days for spreading rumors or spreading conspiracy theories in Hong Kong, which are apparently not true. And we are seeing all these kind of suppression and also pressure being put on different media outlets in Hong Kong, not only on Apple Daily, on RTHK, but then on also on the other media outlets in Hong Kong. And we are seeing journalists being continuously put at the risk of being charged or threatened that they will get arrested under the national security legislation simply for investigating or, in, or reporting or documenting the truths in Hong Kong. And, as, and apart from all these, we're also witnessing the suppression and also censorship going on in the cultural industry, where we see the artwork by a very, very famous Chinese dissident artist, Ai Weiwei, being censored. His picture, his artwork about uh, Tianan, the, the June 4th Tiananmen massacre were being taken down by the Hong Kong government. We are also uh, seeing that protest-related photo exhibitions or the other art galleries being banned and also rejected to be hosted by different venues in Hong Kong. And also because of the nomination of a pro-democracy documentary to the Oscars, we are also seeing that the, uh, the pro-Beijing media outlets and also television broadcasting company in Hong Kong decided to ban the broadcasting of the Oscars uh, given be be simply because of a pro-democracy documentary. And aside from all these, the Chinese Communist Party itself is also manipulating all the very uh, large-scale propaganda machines to launch attacks on social uh, on pro-democracy figures on different social media platforms. And aside from that, they have also been firing to the spread of this information, discrediting not only the pro-democracy struggle in Hong Kong, but then also on different, for example, reports on uh, the ongoing genocide in the East Turkestan region, uh, on the ongoing suppression of the Tibetan people, and also on the other uh, documentation of Chinese Communist Party's continuous human rights violations in, in these regions and also elsewhere in the world. And even apart from all these uh, propaganda and manipulation, and also apart from all the suppression on cultural industries and on media outlets in Hong Kong, we have also been seeing very uh, worrying and alerting signs where we have several protest-related websites being blocked by the government with reference to the national security legislation. And I would say this is a very concerning development in Hong Kong because this is actually conveying uh, a, a message or this is actually signaling the possibility that the Chinese Communist Party might soon be blocking all these, uh, they might soon be blocking the people of Hong Kong's access to information from the outside world or from uh, credible media outlets to, to, to achieve the goal of a continuous brainwashing of our younger generations and also to block the information in Hong Kong from being uh, projected to the international community. And the reason why I specifically, I specifically brought these issues up is because that the Chinese Communist Party's suppression is, grow, is growing beyond geographic borders, where we see that their long arms are extending to democracy worldwide. We are seeing activists in exile, for example, for Nathan Law, Ted Hoy, they are still, and also the other Uyghur activists and also the other Uyghur communities and families, they are also, they are still in the threat of being uh, afraid of whether they might be kidnapped by uh, agents of the Chinese Party in for example, Australia, the UK, or even in the US, they are still under the threat of receiving different kind of harassment and also threatening messages from the Chinese Communist Party. And all of these are not happening in Hong Kong or any uh, land or regions under the Chinese Communist Party control. These, all these incidents are actually happening on our lands, on the lands of the free world countries. So this is the reason why I wanted to bring this up because we can see how how, how aggressive and also how, uh, how we can see how aggressive and also how 
large scale China, the Chinese Communist Party's suppression has been growing too. And all these kind of like gradual infiltration and also expansion is happening not only in Hong Kong, but also as I have mentioned elsewhere across the globe in the UK, in the US, and also in the many other countries. And given the expanding influence of the Chinese Communist Party with strengthening the soft power, it is a very important question for not only we, the people of Hong Kong, or the Uyghur community or the Tibetans to think about what should be done to tackle the uh, challenges and also threats imposed by the Chinese Communist Party. But then this, this will also be a very important question for the free world countries, because we understand right now that this is not a challenge or this is not a threat simply to the people of Hong Kong or the other people under direct suppression from the Chinese Communist Party. But then this is really a question closely related to national security and also to the well-being of, and also the safety of our own people in the free world countries. Well, very briefly, because Ted and Joey have outlined, uh, I think, the, the answer extremely well, I would just add three very, very quick points. Um, the first is that uh, actually the warning signs were there uh, quite some years ago. Um, the, the, the total uh, dismantling of Hong Kong's freedoms and autonomy uh, really accelerated over the course of the last uh, year or so, especially with the national security law. But if you go back to uh, the umbrella movement in 2014, which was the turning point for my for me uh, to get involved, um, uh, what we saw s between then and and last year was a series of of steps that uh, pointed the way to where we are now. Uh, we saw the abduction of uh, booksellers who were based in Hong Kong publishing books crit critical of the CCP uh, back in 2015. Uh, we saw the disqualification of uh, legislators, uh, not only last November, where uh, some of Ted's uh, colleagues were disqualified and the whole democracy movement then uh, w was effectively thrown out of the legislature, but, but way back in uh, 2015, um, Nathan Law uh, and a number of others uh, were disqualified uh, uh, simply, I mean, in Nathan Law's case, uh, he was disqualified because he'd taken his oath of office perfectly properly, but he had added a quote from Mahatma Gandhi at the end of uh, his oath, and uh, and 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 he was disqualified for that reason. Um, and then we saw uh, Joshua Wong and Nathan Law first imprisoned in 2017, um, uh, before all the recent Im imprisonments. So the warning signs were there, and and one of my criticisms of the international community and, and particularly my own government in the United Kingdom is if we had uh, uh, acted more robustly uh, earlier, we might, I mean, it's hard to know with hindsight, but we might have been able to prevent things uh, deteriorating so, so rapidly. And uh, as it was, I feel the international community only really started to take a stand in the last year, by which time it was uh, arguably, you know, almost too late. Um, the, the second point to add is um, t Ted already spoke about the uh, CCP's use of, of, um, of, of capital in, in Hong Kong uh, to, to lead to, to enable them to do what they've done. Uh, and it's very interesting. If you compare, um, in 2003, there was an attempt to introduce uh, uh, something similar to the national security law. And that provoked uh, huge opposition in the city, mass protests. Uh, and at, at that time, the um, composition of, of the, the business community was, uh, there was still quite a lot of people in the business community who who were not aligned to the CCP, who were either Hong Kong businesses or international businesses who were willing to make it clear that they, they uh, wouldn't accept uh, this law. And so in the end, the Hong Kong government uh, backed down and withdrew the, the proposed law back in 2003. But the CCP then realized that what they needed to do in order to take political control was to really strengthen their, their economic control of, of the city. And we've recently published in, in Hong Kong Watch uh, a new report uh, uh, called Red Capital, uh, uh, charting the course of, of the Chinese economic uh, influence in Hong Kong uh, and how that's uh, allowed them then to uh, silence people, to establish, for example, CCP uh, party uh, branches in 
uh, multi uh, multinational companies in in Hong Kong, so that employees of major banks or major uh, corporations are are then instructed uh, that they they can't take part in protests. They mustn't make political expressions uh, in their own personal capacity. So that influence of red capital, I think, was very significant. And then thirdly, just building on what Joey was was saying just now, um, one thing that's really important to remember about the national security law. Uh, is uh, that it has a clause in it uh, that is um, extraterritorial uh, in its application, which means in effect that uh, anyone anywhere in the world uh, who is deemed to be in breach of the national security law uh, uh, can be, you know, is is uh, in, at least in theory is regarded as 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 violating that law, um, which is uh, which is a ridiculous uh, concept, but but it but in in effect, it means you don't have to be a Hong Konger and you don't have to be in Hong Kong. So since July last year, I think I've been breaching the national security law every day, several times a day, and, and definitely so have Joey and Ted. Uh, and, um, and even what we're doing today uh, arguably could be regarded as as violating the national security law. So that's the, the at least in theory, the reach. Now, I, I don't feel in danger myself. But as Joey said, Hong Kongers uh, around the world outside Hong Kong uh, do. And and that's important to remember. Wow. Thank you. That was very enlightening, and, but also frightening. And I, uh, I want to ask a question, especially since we have um, congressional staff participating. Our forums are, are really targeted for congressional staff. But um, I want to ask about the bills and resolutions that have been introduced in the U.S. Congress with bipartisan support. There's quite a number. There's the Safe Harbors Act. There's the Safeguarding Internet Freedom Act. There's even one calling for the PRC to be removed from the U.N. Security Council, which I would totally endorse, but I don't think that's going anywhere. But I love the idea. But also a call for the IOC to rebid the 2022 Winter Olympics, which are being called the Genocide Olympics. I think that's a very absolutely something should be done. But can you walk us through um, what are the things that the U.S. Congress could do to really have an impact in helping the people of Hong Kong? What are the things that you think are with the, specifically for the Congress? And then after that, we'll have another question about the international community. But go ahead, Ted. Yes. Um, of course, the uh, U.S. Congress has done a lot, as, as you said, and I'm, I'm also grateful for the efforts and the past in terms of uh, sanctions and in terms of all the statements and resolution being passed in support of Hong Kong. Um, but if you ask me what's more that Congress uh, can be doing, uh, the first thing that I would say that is to strengthen the sanctions and to widen the sanctions as well, uh, because the Hong Kong's uh, Human Rights and Democracy Act is powerful, and it is uh, something that's influencing uh, the behavior of high officials in, in Hong Kong. And so we, now we can see that um, uh, the high officials' bank accounts and visa cards, their assets are affected. And in, in long term, I would say it's more than just slight inconveniences. For, for those officials. But now I can see that the scope and the people involved are can be limited. But there are human rights violations in every aspect uh, in the society. For example, what we've just mentioned earlier that, uh, for example, the, our public broadcaster, RTHK, now with their uh, TV and radio programs withdrawn. And why don't we uh, uh, put sanctions and punishments on those people who are involved in making those decisions because it's directly threatening our freedom of press and how about for those high officials who are involved in changing our hong kong's primary schools curriculums into brainwashing ones and now uh, people are taught to believe that they have to be loyal to their countries no matter what and ignore all the human rights violations for those high officials, I think they are responsible for uh, they are human rights violators them, themselves. Many of them are, of course, uh, public servants, but they are willing to serve uh, the regimes uh, for for what they get. 
So widening the sanctions or towards these people, I, I believe is one thing that Congress can discuss. And secondly, uh, life vote plans. And I've been talking to uh, different nations, of course, uh, for providing life vote plans for, for especially the young protesters. Because now uh, with all of us politicians and activists in jail, they will be the next targets. And I, I would personally estimate that there will be hundreds and thousands of cases coming um, for what they have done in the protest uh, for, for the last two years. So they are, for many young people, they are in need of a safe place, a safe haven to go to. So if uh, the Congress and have these discussions to provide safe havens, even in the US, and that will be really useful and uh, practical help to those in need. And of course, uh, with the US being uh, uh, economic and uh, international opinion leaders, and uh, the, the Congress can always take the lead in the discussions of further uh, boycotting Beijing. So uh, you mentioned, uh, the, of course, the 2022 Winter Olympics and other sport events and international events. Uh, I, I believe that uh, it's for the US uh, to take the lead. And for examples, uh, uh, and understand it more, that I can see uh, even parliamentarians in the UK are talking about uh, pressuring uh, the sponsors of uh, the a Wimbledon tennis tournament. And I, I think that can, uh, might not have an immediate effect, but it's pressuring uh, human rights violators, allies uh, in the business sectors. So it's also a signal that, uh, that Beijing cannot be benefiting uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, fi financially uh, from major uh, interna international events. So, um, there can be, of course, uh, more congressional discussions in uh, uh, regarding the business sectors. And I understand that scholars are discussing uh, ESG standards, uh, the environmental, social, and corporate co uh, governance standards in business. So uh, it can be done through uh, the part of US parliament in, or in any parliament in the world of setting up uh, best practices uh, and professional standards that takes into account uh, human rights and social values so that uh, the business sectors are more influenced uh, into consider, for example, labor rights in uh, forced slavery, forced labor in, in Xinjiang uh, in terms of uh, their business traits or relationships. I think these are all uh, the matters that the US Congress can take into account and take the, take the lead in, in furthering the discussions would be very much helpful, not only for freedom in Hong Kong, but freedom of the world. Yeah, I would, I would very much uh, agree with what Pat has mentioned. And Actually, the United States have been doing a lot in terms of defending the rights and also freedoms of the people of Hong Kong and also the other communities which are also under suppression of the Chinese Communist Party. So, for example, we see the uh, we see the implementation of the U.S. Hong Kong Policy Act back uh, to, uh, several years, uh, a lot of years ago, and then we also see the passage of the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act back in 2019, which would require the State Department to submit annual reports to the Congress and to uh, report and to document the continuous human rights violations of the Chinese Communist Party in Hong Kong. And this could be a very, very strong and also very, very effective evidentiary support to Hong Kongers when it comes to uh, lobbying for international attention to, uh, to, to, to issue sanctions, for example, on targeted Chinese officials and also to lobby for international Support on, support on implementing different legislations to support and also to defend the rights of the people of Hong Kong. And then currently we also see the, uh, the, the proposal of the, safe, the Hong Kong Safe Harbor Act, which is aiming at to provide a shelter for Hong Kongers. And as Ted had mentioned that this would be a very, very important legislation for Hong Kongers because with the implementation of the national security legislation and also with the exploitation, exploitation and also with the manipulation of the existing public order ordinance in Hong Kong, 
we have more than 10,000 Hong Kong protesters arrested or charged under the uh, under different very serious criminal offenses, including rioting, unlawful assembly, and also other criminal offenses in Hong Kong already. And then aside from that, we also have a lot of activists, politicians, and district councillors in Hong Kong who are also so politically exposed and being put at very high risk of being politically persecuted. So it would be very, very crucial for not only the United States, but then also for the other uh, free world countries to provide support for Hong Kongers and to provide them a shelter for a relocation and to come to their countries to seek a safe haven. And that would be a very important step for the US Congress and also for the other parliaments to take. And aside from providing safe shelters for Hong Kongers and to submit reports regarding the uh, ongoing violations of human rights in Hong Kong, it will also be very important for the United States government and also the, con the Congress to exercise our existing mechanisms and also to make use of our existing legislations. For example, the Global Manisky Act, for example, the Hong Kong Autonomy Act to continue to uh, impose targeted sanctions on Chinese officials, Hong Kong officials, and also officials who were also involved in human rights violations and the ongoing genocide in the East Turkestan region and also against the Tibetan people. And actually, from uh, for, for since 2019 up until now, we see a lot of uh, sanctions imposed on especially individuals from the Chinese Communist Party and also in the Hong Kong government. But then aside from uh, sanctioning individuals, we also felt like it would be extremely important for us to also target entities, especially financial institutions, we ha which have been involved or have been contributing to the human rights atrocities committed by the Chinese Party. For example, HSBC, which has frozen TED and also the other pro-democracy uh, stakeholders accounts simply because that they sub in simply because that they support the uh, implementation of national security legislation and listened to the Hong Kong police force and the Hong Kong government that uh, that uh, uh, innocent. Uh, figures, for example, like Tad, have been involved in different uh, made trumped up charges uh, given by the Hong Kong government. It would be extremely important for us to also investigate and then to look into the possible sanctions that we could impose on these financial institutions and also entities. And as Ben and as Ben have mentioned, that red capital has always been one of Beijing's most powerful weapons in terms of a gradual infiltration and also in terms of their uh, process of gaining control over different industries and over and also over different local economies, especially on high tech industries, to feed their military civil fusion strategy of turning the People's Liberation Army into one of the world's strongest and also most powerful military. And then we are also seeing that they have been making use of their red capital, especially their state-owned enterprises, to achieve the target of infiltrating and controlling different sectors in Hong Kong and also elsewhere in different uh, countries in the free world. So it would be really important for us to look into this issue and also to uh, impose and implement related legislations to regulate the, uh, the operation of these state-owned enterprises, which have been working so closely with the Chinese Communist Party in terms of infiltrating and also in terms of stealing technology or have been uh, involved or assisting the Chinese Communist Party in terms of committing di different human rights atrocities, not only in Hong Kong, East Turkestan, but then also elsewhere in the world. And, it, it, and, and also it would be really, really important for the United States or for the other countries to also highlight the importance of co cooperate responsibilities because even aside from all these state-owned enterprises, we are also seeing our own companies have been kowtowing to Beijing. We have been sacrificing our human rights values uh, in exchange of the very great and also very, uh, very, very attractive economic benefits from the Chinese Communist Party. So it would also for us to highlight and also to stress on the importance of responsibilities of our own companies and to regulate the business and also corporations between our own companies and with the Chinese Communist Party or with all these state-owned enterprises. And actually, we are very grateful and also motivated to see the introduction of the uh, very recent Strategic Competition Act of, 2000, Act of 2021 introduced by the chairperson, Senator Bob Menendez of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And also, we are very encouraged and motivated to see the proposal and also implementation of different legislations regarding the, the regarding to uh, in, re, in response to defend the 
rights and also freedoms of the people of Hong Kong and also the rights of freedoms of the people uh, of the Uyghurs community and also of the Tibetan community. And it is very, very important for us to always bear in mind that we would need a very comprehensive China strategy that, that cross uh, different departments in the United States and also requires the uh, cooperation and also requires the uh, construction of a democratic alliance to, to really work with our partners of the free world and to really take coordinated actions actions in terms of imposing sanctions and also in terms of uh, implementing different preventive, preventive and also proactive measures in terms of countering the threats and also challenges imposed by the Chinese party. Um. Uh, the total unity on this panel. I, I agree entirely with um, what Ted and Joey have said, uh, particularly on uh, sanctions and the lifeboat uh, 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 policy. Um, just a few uh, thoughts, um, and I think those two are the priority uh, concerns, but a, a few other things that Congress could do. Um, first of all, as there are more and more uh, uh, political prisoners in Hong Kong, uh, I think uh, members of Congress, uh, either individually or collectively, could be uh, speaking out for political prisoners, demanding their release, or at least keeping the spotlight on them. So, for example, last Friday, uh, Jimmy Lai, the, the proprietor of the Apple Daily, the, the only pro-democracy uh, daily newspaper left in, in Hong Kong, uh, was, uh, was given a sentence, but he faces several other charges uh, under the national security law and, and is very likely to face um, many years in, in prison. Uh, other democracy uh, activists were, were given sentences as well last Friday. Um, people like Joshua Wong and Agnes Chow uh, are already in, in prison. So keeping a spotlight on them, making sure they're not forgotten, uh, uh, it would be really important. Um, secondly, um, I think monitoring uh, really closely further uh, erosions of, of whatever f small uh, remnants of freedom may, may be left. So particularly uh, paying close attention to what happens to media freedom. Uh, uh, at the moment, the Apple Daily does still exist, but there are uh, threats, uh, increasing threats to the Apple Daily. And if the Apple Daily is forced to, to shut down, then essentially press freedom is completely gone. Um, so, so uh, keeping up the, the focus on that. I think also religious freedom, uh, until uh, relatively recently, religious freedom was perhaps the, uh, the one freedom that uh, was still intact. Uh, people can still go to places of worship uh, uh, relatively freely. Um, but of course, wherever freedom is itself is dismantled, religious freedom as a part of freedom um, will sooner or later be affected. And we're already seeing, we've seen one church uh, whose past uh, had been involved in assisting the protesters in 2019. Uh, his church was raided, his bank accounts were, were frozen. Uh, we've seen the Catholic uh, Diocese of Hong Kong uh, instructing clergy to, uh, um, the exact words were, watch your words uh, in your sermons. Uh, um, uh, and also um, the pressure of the national security law education on the faith schools, the church schools uh, in Hong Kong. So I think uh, bodies like the US Commission on uh, International Religious Freedom and the uh, when, when a new ambassador at large for international religious freedom is appointed, uh, they, should, uh, they should monitor uh, that um, very, very closely. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to conclude with a point that I think will lead into your next question. But um, Two, two points. Firstly, I'm very aware of how much bipartisan support there is on, on, on these questions, and um, that's to, really to be welcomed, and, and I, I, I really uh, encourage and appreciate that. I know that uh, the Biden ad administration has a particular focus on multilateral approaches, uh, and I think that is definitely to be encouraged. Um, so I would urge Congress to uh, encourage the, the administration uh, in its multilateral approach to do a number of things. Um, firstly, to make sure that uh, if there is a summit of democracies, which I think President Biden has proposed, um, there be a, a big focus uh, on Hong Kong and on what the international community as a whole uh, can do. Um, secondly, if um, the British Prime Minister has, has proposed the 
um, idea of a D10 alliance of democracies. Uh, and again, uh, the US and others should encourage uh, that to particularly focus on, on Hong Kong. And then thirdly, um, I, I, as the, the Biden administration uh, perhaps plays a more, um, more active role at the United Nations. And of course, the United Nations has many faults and, uh, you know, can be toothless, but it is there. Um, and there are mechanisms at the UN that could be created uh, or used. For example, uh, there's growing uh, uh, calls for uh, the creation of a UN special rapporteur, uh, either on Hong Kong specifically or, or on China as a whole. Um, we started calling for that last year. Uh, a number of former UN special rapporteurs supported that call uh, for a rapporteur on, on Hong Kong. Uh, and then, in fact, uh, last summer, um, over 50 serving UN special rapporteurs actually called for the creation of a, of a mechanism on China uh, as a whole. Uh, and I, I think if Congress could, could encourage the administration to, to use its presence at the UN to, to build up momentum uh, in support of that. Of course, um, we don't want it, anything to be tabled until uh, the numbers are there at the Human Rights Council. Um, uh, we don't want to give China a propaganda victory. And that may mean working on this for over a longer period of time. But uh, Suzanne, you, you'll recall when um, we, we, we campaigned together for the creation of a UN Commission of Inquiry on North Korea. And at the start, people said that will never happen. Um, and through persistence and, and, uh, and, and hard work in advocacy, um, it, it happened. So I think there are things that could be done uh, at a multilateral level in those various fora, including the UN. And I would encourage Congress to urge the administration to, to do those things. Well, Ben, I remember we were in a Thai restaurant in Arlington when we talked about the creation of the UN Commission of Inquiry in North Korea, and it's definitely had an impact. Okay, a question for uh, for the audience um, before we wrap up. I, I just want to say this is a this um, forum is going to be available on YouTube for people to watch. And so this particular question from the audience uh, is dealing with. We talked about what Congress can do, but just as um, is a closing question, what can uh, we do? for Hong Kong, including the United States. I think you covered some of that, but the international community, but also as private citizens. What are some of the things as we as we wrap up that we can do as private citizens? Because this is gonna, like I said, this audience that we're targeting is not just the Congress, but also the American people and the international community. And I will go to Ted first. Um, what, what else, uh, else uh, uh, normal people, normal citizens can do? Of course, a lot more solidarity work and uh, join the camps, uh, stand up and speak up against human rights violations, human rights uh, crackdowns on Hong Kong. And of course, and um, for different nations in the world, uh, there are uh, extradition treaties, uh, more than 50 of them still having an extradition treaty with, with China. And so, uh, for example, for the Danish politicians who helped me out of Hong Kong, they are now facing, uh, they, are, they are put onto the list of the uh, arrest, a wanted list for arrest. So you can see that the, the China's power, CCP's power is, is expanding, it's endangering uh, the rest of the world. So more can be done uh, also on the civil society level, um, both locally and internationally, put resources uh, on uh, NGOs and INGOs uh, that promote liberal values, uh, build bonds and partnerships with Hong Kongers organizations and uh, human rights organizations. I, I think that's also uh, very, very important. And of course, for um, a normal citizens uh, in the US or in the world, uh, I would say uh, try it uh, to be sympathetic to Hong Kongers uh, where they live in your country. Uh, look into their, to, their organizations, their, their, their activities, and talk about human rights uh, with them and uh, learn about their stories and tell the stories of Hong Kongs uh, among your own communities. Tell the stories about uh, Hong Kong to your MPs or those who represent you 
in in your parliaments uh because uh it's it's you that changed their behavior it's you that changed the the mps and uh the councillors uh policy changed their minds and i i think from from bottom up uh in in turns uh it will be uh there will be a change and for Hong Kong's freedom and for the world's freedom. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, nowadays we felt like tyrannies are joining their hands in altering our our, our international rule based order. So we, it is really important for countries to coordinate actions together to 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 counter this oppression and also such posed by the not only the only the Chinese Communist Party but then also by the for example the Burmese military for example from Pudding and also from uh, the other human rights abuses across the globe and it is really important for countries including the United States and also the other free world countries to consolidate a long term and also solid democratic alliance that would coordinate a uh, joint efforts into countering the threats and also challenges posed by tyrannies across the globe to defend our shared values and also interests. And it would really it would be really important that the United States to continue to take the lead in constructing a joint effort by different countries. And it will also be very crucial for countries to be the backbones of each other to encourage and also to support to provide uh, assistance to countries that are willing to stand up against the Chinese Communist Party, but then are suffering from uh, economic sacrifices and also the suppression from the Chinese Communist Party. It would be very crucial for us to encourage actions and also to take concrete actions in supporting each other uh, if they are going to suffer from the economic suppressions from the from the Beijing government. And for individuals, it would be very effective and very helpful if we could all try to help spread a word on social media platforms to donate or to volunteer for diaspora Hong Kong communities or the other diaspora uh, organizations across the globe and really to participate in protests and also rallies in your local community in your local in your local neighborhood and also in your local cities because even though these steps or actions might seem like very tiny baby steps but then really every effort and also every action would be a meaningful and effective action taken to defend the values of not only Hong Kongers and also the values that we share and we cherished for so long. And just to conclude the uh, my sharing or my points, I would really uh, want to uh, urge you all to not only to continue to pay close attention to the developments in Hong Kong, but also the, the developments and also the protests in Belarus, in Burma, and especially to Nafani, who has recently reported that he is being uh, in a dying condition from the torture from Putin. So it would be really, really important and really, really crucial for us to really keep up the international attention on all these issues and on and really to shine a light on all these very, very brave human rights defenders and also activists across the globe. So thank you. Well, um, uh, as as has been the case throughout the panel, <laughs> once again, um, I, I'm in total agreement with Ted and Jerry. Uh, and I think the only thing I can add, well, firstly, to reiterate, I think um, I think every every citizen has a part to play, uh, and citizens can do the things that have already been mentioned: uh, support organisations, join protests, also crucially, write to your elected representatives, whether that's in the United States or, or elsewhere in the world, uh, to because uh, I think in all our democratic systems, th there are legislators who um, are already on top of issues and because they care and they're interested, but there are other legislators who, um, who might not necessarily have a, a, an interest initially, but if they're hearing from their constituents, then uh, then they will uh, have an interest. So definitely uh, an important role to, to play there. I think just to expand very briefly on uh, something I think Ted uh, said, which is um, as more Hong Kongers come to our countries, I think it's really important that we are there as, as citizens to befriend them, welcome them, help them settle in, help them integrate. Uh, we in the UK are expecting uh, probably the largest uh, number of Hong Kongers uh, in coming months because the British government uh, last year, immediately after the national security law, 
uh, was imposed on Hong Kong, uh, announced an incredibly courageous and generous uh, uh, policy uh, for Hong Kongers who hold um, British national overseas uh, status, which up until July last year was a status that actually didn't confer on them any uh, citizenship rights in the UK. It was just a, a passport, basically. But um, with the government's new uh, policy, uh, it gives uh, up to about 3 million pe people and their dependents, so potentially a total of maybe up to 5 million, uh, the right to come to the UK uh, and to be on a pathway to citizenship. Now, we're not expecting 5 million people to come, but we, we are expecting um, significant numbers to come. And so here in, in the UK, we've been mobilizing uh, civil society, ordinary citizens um, to to get together to to be ready to uh, welcome them. Um, there's a wonderful network that's been started by a friend of mine uh, of churches throughout the UK. Uh, uh, he's called it Hong Kong Ready Churches, and he's recruited something like 500 churches to be part of that. Um, but there are but there are um, non faith based initiatives uh, as well. Um, and there's actually a, a welcoming committee that's been established. Uh, that brings together all these different initiatives. So as hopefully uh, the Safe Harbor Act and, and other lifeboat policies are, are implemented in the United States or, or in other parts of the world, I hope citizens will uh, get ready to to welcome Hong Kongers and uh, and support them as they as they settle in. And I just end by s simply saying um, I, I agree very much with what Joey has said about standing in solidarity with people struggling for freedom, democracy, and human rights uh, everywhere. Um, I would, of course, add to the list that Joey mentioned, I would add North Korea, um, especially with Suzanne uh, hosting this and because of my own long-standing involvement in, in North Korea. And it, it's quite interesting, actually, uh, last uh, couple of years ago, the um, former South Korean ambassador for human rights in North Korea, jung Hun Lee, wrote a, uh, an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal about Hong Kong. And he, he said, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said something along the lines of, uh, he'd spent most of his uh, adult life uh, speaking out for the most closed uh, place in the world, uh, North Korea. And now he was lending his voice uh, to the struggle for freedom for what had been until relatively recently one of Asia's most open cities, uh, Hong Kong. And I think that correlation of standing for those who have never had freedom and who yearn for it, uh, and those who have had freedom and have had it taken away from them is really important. And that we should always remember that anywhere in the world where freedom is threatened, uh, that is a threat to freedom everywhere. Thank you. Very, very eloquently put. That's a Ben, one wonderful, wonderful observation. I, I uh, want to thank you all. You have been amazing. You are such an inspiration. Um, we're so proud to have hosted this forum and hear uh, your stories. And we admire your bravery. I hope that this uh, forum will be viewed many, many times and will be an, an inspiration to people to get involved. And I want to just Hong Kong Watch is the organization that Ben and Joey are a part of um, and, and Ted as well. And I just want to encourage everyone who's watching this video today and in the future to get involved in this cause. Because as you know, Ben pointed out, it, we're all, we're, we all have a stake when people's rights are threatened, when freedoms are threatened, for those who've never had freedom, for those that are that are threatening, they're losing it. So God bless you all. Thank you again so much for giving us the honor of hosting you. And one final shout out. Thank you, Jason West, behind the scenes, making sure that the CCP did not interfere with this broadcast. Thank you again. God bless you.